don't remember ever preaching on, but I've taught the book which much of this comes from years ago. And a church that I pastored I used to have a Tuesday morning Bible study for anyone who wanted to come, who was men who worked at night and could come, and ladies who didn't have a job, and I talked through this book that it comes from. And what I'm going to speak to you today is about faith. What is faith? And so I want to just say a few things about what faith is and what faith is not, first of all. Just some general statements about faith. Faith is calling those things which are not as though they are. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. You speak those things which are not as though they are. Then in Romans 14, 23, Paul says, Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Any walk that is less than a walk of faith is a sinful walk. Faith is not real. Yes, faith is reason at rest. You understand what I mean by that? So many people have tried to reason out things in their life instead of accepting the Word of God for what it is. And I've said to many people many times in my life as a minister, how many times does God have to say something for it to be true? <laughs> You either believe the word or you don't believe it. Amen. And faith is believing it. And putting your senses and your reasoning to rest and trusting in God. The next statement is faith is dependency upon God. And this God dependency only begins when you put yourself dependency away. Now, faith doesn't always remove you from the storm. But faith will take you through the storm. And will give you peace in the midst of that. And, of course, you know, Roman, or, uh, Psalms 23 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Didn't say you walk into it, but it says you walk through it. And faith takes you through the storm. God has also said, and I didn't write this scripture down, but it comes to my mind, that in everything you go through, God will make a way of escape that you may be able to bear. There can really be no spiritual reality apart from active faith in Christ. If there's no active faith in Christ, there'll be no salvation. Because of Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says what? By grace. By grace through faith, you receive eternal life. So without faith, there's no salvation. Really, without faith, there's no peace in your life. There's no power in your life. There's no witness in your life of who God is in your life. And there's no victory. Now, that's several things that I've said. You don't have without faith. Victory comes through faith in God. And we trust Him this way. Now, faith bids eternal truth to become present fact. Now, I'm reminded of Pastor Joe saying so many times, the Word says it, 
and I made a choice to believe it and act on it and live by it. And that's what every one of us need to do. I hear people say, God says it and I believe it and that settles it. That is not true. <laughs> God said it, and that settles it, whether you believe it or not. Amen. Amen. Yes. <laughs> it helps if you believe it. Yeah. Makes a big difference in your life if, if you believe it. Faith enables the believing soul to treat the future as present and the invisible as visible. We're going to talk about that some later, okay? Uh, the opposite of faith is what? Fear. fear. How many people do you know walk in fear? Because they really don't believe God's Word. There's really no easy definition of what faith is. But scripture says in Romans 10, 17, I believe, faith comes by hearing the word of God. And receiving what you hear. Now, in, Revel in Hebrews 11, 1, which is the 11th chapter, is called the chapter of faith. In the King James Version of your Bible, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's in the King James translation. Now substance, when you think of substance, what do you think of? Reality. Tangible. Normally people think of things. <laughs> All kinds of things. However, that is a mistranslation of the scripture. The word for faith in the original is the word hopostasis, which means assurance. Do you have the assurance that something you believe is going to happen? That is more than things. Or let's say money or other other things. Assurance. It means assurance. <coughs> and it talks about the whole the things hoped for are trusted. Means that it endures are the proving of things not seen, also the conviction or proof of what is not seen. It's a guarantee or reality, sometimes referred to as a title deed. In the New American Standard, which is my favorite translation of the Bible, because I think it's a little more correct than some of the, of the King James is in places, says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The Amplified Bible also uses the word assurance. Now faith is the assurance, the confirmation of the type of deed of things, of the things we hope for, being the proof of the things we do not see and the convictions of their reality Faith, receiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. So many people in trying to live by faith and work by faith depend on their senses, depend on their senses. Faith never works by your senses. It works by belief. When we believe, now, 
there's a sense in which uh, faith here as referred to here as assurance literally means a standing under or a giving of a guarantee or reality. Uh, faith can be intellectual. Now, when I say that, faith can be intellectual. You have to read the word, you have, have to understand it, and you put it into practice. But most people, when faith is intellectual, they say, well, God can do it. God can do anything. Is that true? Uh, no. Not sure. So. <laughs> no, he can't force a person to be born again. It's for hell. No. You can believe God can do anything all you want to, but he's probably not going to do much. <clears throat> you just say him. So many people, I say, I, I have heard over years say, I believe can, God can do anything. I believe he can heal me. I believe he can do all of this. But you never see it take place in their life. Because it's intellectual belief. It's not the faith kind of believing. And with many people, faith is emotional. Last week, Pastor Joe said, faith is not emotional which is true. But most people say, oh, I want God so bad to do this. I want so bad to do this. So I'll, I'll pray all I can pray and I'll, I'll uh, change my life and all of these things to get God to answer my prayer. Is that the way he answers it? No. No matter how bad you want him to if that's what you're operating on in your senses and emotion is one of the parts of your soul, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And God wants, it doesn't work that way. God doesn't work on sympathy or begging. He works by faith yeah. in your life and believing but faith really is volitional and you know what I mean by volitional choice that's a choice an act of your will as I mentioned a while ago I've heard Pastor Joe say several times I've read it in the word I believe it I made a choice to believe it and that settles it so faith is volitional, and uh, this means that when I pray for something, or when I believe God for something, even though I don't see the immediate answer to that, I still believe that it's done. Amen. And believe that it's going to happen. And I remember a few, three, four months ago, playing for a lady who'd had back surgery and then found, discovered she had a cracked vertebrae close to where they'd done the surgery and she was in a wheelchair. And I prayed for her and spoke her healing. She's now out of that wheelchair. Amen. She's walking around. Now it didn't manifest itself for several weeks. It was gradual. She got out of the wheelchair and she walked with a walker for a while and now nothing. See my question is when you pray for somebody do you believe it's going to happen? Are you hoping that it happens? Faith is volitional. Now in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, in the second verse, 
the King James says, For by it the elders obtained a good report. The word report here is not does not mean that people gave him a report of what was happening. It means that the and the word here is martyr, which means a witness or a testimony or the, obtain a report. They received a witness from God that what God had promised they would receive. It was not man's report, but it's God's report. They received a report from God that what they prayed for, it was going to happen. Have you ever had that happen to you? Before it happened? That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying here. The men of old, in the 11th chapter, you have this roll call of faith there. That these people receive a word from God that what they prayed for was done. Even though, in some cases, they did not see it in their lifetime. And I've heard reports by many that they prayed for a person to be saved, believed that that person would be saved, and then after they were gone, the person was saved. They received that witness that it was going to happen. And uh, the word elders here does not refer to, like myself, Pastor Joe, or Greeny, or any officer in the church it talks about like father images and in one place it says men of old receive this report now probably the, the one of the greatest that we know of in the Bible who received such a report was who who do you think of Abraham Abraham received a report in more than one report. First of all, when God said to him, Abraham, I want you to leave your family and your country and go to a new country that I will show you. Now, how many of you at 75 years of age, you're not, most of you are not there, some of us. I guess I'm probably, Darlene and I are probably the only ones that pass that say to you, I want you to pack up and go to a place that I'm going to show you and when you get there I'll show you a city. And then God said to him I'm going to give you a son. And through that son all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And then what did God do? He said to Abraham, I want you to go sacrificing on a place that I showed you. What did Abraham do? He obeyed, didn't he? Yeah. And you know why he obeyed? In Hebrews 11, 19, it says, that Abraham accounted that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from which also he received him in a figure before Abraham ever went he believed what? that God would raise him from the dead and then in Genesis 22 5 it says that when they got to the bottom of the mountain, Abraham said to the young men, Abide here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. And what? Come again. He would not have offered Abraham or Isaac as a sacrifice if he did not know that God would raise him from the dead because I believe if Abraham believed if God could give him a son 
at 100 years of age, he can also raise him from the dead. Because both of them were miracles, weren't they? Would have been. Yeah. Okay. So Abraham is a, a good example of those who receive a report from God. That what they, God said, the promise that God gave was true. There, another one has to do with Moses. The same thing happened to, to Moses in the 24th through the 26th verses of this 11th chapter. It says that by faith Moses, when he was come to the years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. 25 says, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Moses made, I believe when his mother was raising him for the daughter of Pharaoh, she taught him the word of God and taught him about Jehovah God. And he chose God instead of the pleasures of sin. In verse 26, it says, Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. In other words, he was willing to suffer the reproach. He didn't know Christ, but I think he saw him. I think he saw him at the burning bush. Not in, in physical eyes, but in spiritual eyes. And in verse 27, it says, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. That's why it's just said, I believe he saw Jesus. And seeing Jesus made such a change in his life that he's willing to give up the world to obey God. So there is an example, another example, of receiving the report. And I remember years, years, several years ago, hearing a friend of mine tell about being in a church where there was a lady in the church who had a teenage son who was lost. And she had asked the church to pray for him, for him to be saved. And she would, he would tell his mother, no, I'm not going to be saved. I'm not going to be a Christian. I'm going to play football and go to hell. And one night, at a prayer service, somebody mentioned, we need to pray for sister so-and-so's son. She said, nope. No prayer of unbelief. My son is going to be saved. He's saved. God's already shown me he's saved. Don't pray a prayer of unbelief. You pray and thank God for his salvation. The next day, one of the men at the church saw this teenage boy downtown and he said to him, Oh, I'm so glad to hear that you're saved. And he got real upset and he said, No, I'm not saved. He said, I'm going to play football and go to hell. He came home and jumped his mother. He said, What do you mean telling those people at the church I'm saved? He said, I'm not saved. I'm going to play football and I'm going to hell. She said, well, I have another word for you. <laughs> Not only are you saved, but you're going to give your testimony in church Sunday. <laughs> oh, he really got upset with his mother. He went to football practice Friday afternoon. And on the football field in practice, the Spirit of God hit him and got hold of him. And he fell to his knees gave his heart and life to the Lord. 
He gave his testimony Sunday <laughs> in church. Now, is that a report from God? God gave her a report of this what he promised in his word. And she believed it. And she would not let anybody pray a prayer of unbelief. Betty wasn't saying. Now, have you experienced things like that in your life? If you haven't, you should. I remember several years ago that we became friends of a man who was Jewish. His wife was a Christian lady. He used to come to my church with her. He always wanted to argue the scripture with me. I, no joke. I'll talk to you, but I'm not going to argue with you. It's quite a story. He had diabetes and heart problems. And his wife's name was Darlene, like mine. One day she called me. She said, Robert, what in the world am I going to do? Joe is like an old bear. Nothing I do pleases him. I said to her, Darlene, don't be upset. The Holy Spirit of God is working on him and he's given us the assurance that he's going to be saved. She called me one night, one Thursday night, and said, Joe's in the hospital. The intensive care, cardiac work, and you go see him. I got to the hospital that night about 9 o'clock. I walked into his room and he said, Robert, you got me. I said, Joe, I don't want you. <laughs> Jesus wants you. He said, well, I'm going to do what you've been talking to me about when I get out of the hospital. We went to his home after he got out of the hospital. And they lived in Golden in a mobile home. Darlene always, when we were there, she always had to have some kind of a snack or, or dessert to service. And she was getting it ready. And we, Joe and I were sitting at the table, and she and Darlene were doing something. And he said, Robert, shall I tell him? I said, Joe, there's no time like the present. And so I led him in the sinner's prayer. And when I got through, I was pastor in the Baptist church at the time. He said, am I a Baptist? I said, no, Joe. You're a son of God. You talk about a change in a man. Drastic change. God had given both Darlene and I the report that Joe was going to be saved. Six months later, he died. Now I tell you other reports of things of this nature. But this is a very important verse of scripture for us to understand. That when we pray according to God's word, he will give us the report. And we have to stand on that report that it's done. No matter what anybody says to you about it. Not long ago, one of my daughter-in-laws was at my house and we were talking. And I mentioned 1 John 4, 17, it says, Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we. Her question was, are you God? I said, I didn't say that. I'm not God. But, his word says, as he is, so am I. And that tells me that he's given me authority over Satan, over sickness and disease and other things. I'm not the healer. He is. But I believe his word that says, for instance, 1 Peter 3.24, 
that by his stripes you are healed? No. Were healed. And I believe it. And I believe that he, every believer was healed at the cross. And when I pray for somebody to be healed, I expect them to be healed. It may not happen immediately, <laughs> but it may happen down the road. I have a friend who translates, translates Hebrews 11.1 1 in this way. Faith is acting like it's so. When it's not so, in order for it to be so. Now think about that. And I believed that for years. And a lot of times people say, well, you prayed for me, but I don't see anything. I said, praise God that it's done. Amen. Praise God that it's done. Right. <laughs> Give him praise. That it's done. Thank him that it's done. And I know our name has been prayed for for healing in her knees and her hip and things. And it's not been manifested, but we're believing God that it's done. Amen. Now in Hebrews 11, 6, uh, uh, the writer says, but without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, this means that we must believe that God is real, that he exists, that he loves you, that he has saved you. He's Provided for you everything that you need. That's what the writer is saying here. We must believe that he is. Not only that he is, but that he is also a rewarder of those who believe by faith. Is God the rewarder? Yes, he is. For you? He's provided for you all that you need. And He is, you must believe that He wants to do for you what you need. You don't have to beg Him to do it. Just believe Him for it. Right. And praise Him that it's done. Amen. Praise Him that it's done. But he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And that I understand that to mean that I must have a very close personal relationship with the Lord. Do you want everything that he has for you? I, uh, over the years, I've kind of fussed with some Pentecostal people who always talk about a double blessing, which is taken from the Old Testament with Elijah and Elisha. I don't believe the word teaches that. I believe the word teaches that God has given us every spiritual blessing that is available. Amen. That's right. And that's what I want from God. Amen. I want it to be manifested in my life and through my life. I'm not interested in just a portion of what God has. Amen. I want everything He has for me. And so... Uh, <clears throat> we uh, look at this from the standpoint 
Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Where's Jesus? Right now. He's at the right hand of the Father, which is a place of authority, but he's also here. Now, I can't explain to you how that can happen. I just have to believe it. I have to believe that I'm at the right, also that I'm at the right hand of the Father. In Ephesians 1.20 says Christ <coughs> was raised from the dead and is seated at the right hand of God. In Ephesians 2, uh, I believe it's 2, 4, it says that we are seated with him in heavenly places at the right hand of the Father, the place of authority. That tells me that all the authority Jesus has, he's given to me. Now, I can, again, I can't explain to you how I'm seated in heavenly places with Christ, and yet I'm here. But positionally, spiritually, I'm seated in heavenly places with Jesus next to God. And that's a place of authority. And that gives me the authority to pray for people and see things done. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. Faith is assurance that when I pray according to the Word of God, it's done. No matter what the circumstances look like, it's done. Do you have any questions about what I've said so far? Thank you for your patience in listening. Any of you have a prayer meeting before we go? <coughs> I received a call this morning at 12, 1.30 in the morning from a lady friend of ours who came down yesterday with a severe case of pancreatitis. And I talked to her this morning over the phone. I would like for you to join me in praying for her. Name is Julie Downey. So right now I want to pray for her and anybody else who has the need. The scripture said that to agree on it as touching anything it shall be done. So I want you to agree. So Father, in the name of Jesus. I bring before you Julie Downey there in the hospital. Father, I speak to that pancreatitis in her body and I command it to die. I command it to shrivel up and die and be gone. I speak life to her body, God life to her body. I speak healing to her body. And Father, I thank you. You said in your word, whatsoever I ask in the name or demand in the name of Jesus, it shall be done. And I thank you that it's done. Right now, there's no distance in prayer. I send your healing word to her. In Jesus' name. And Father, I pray for anyone who may be listening, who may have a need. I speak healing to them as well. Or if it's a financial need, I speak the providing of the provision 
And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Shall we stand? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you most of all for your word. And Father, I pray that you will take this word and seal it in each one of our hearts who've been here today or who've listened over the internet. That it will be confirmed in our spirit and not lost, but be established there. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. Bye. Let's see you. Bye, Nana. Bye. 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 B